Um, as Patrick said, I'm Brad Whitehead. I'm the chief scientist at Formularity. Uh, before I get started, though, there are some thanks in order. Thanks to the people from Usenix that have allowed me to come here today to talk to you. Thanks to Patrick and Alice, the invited talk chairs. Uh, they've put together, I've been here to, for a number of the presentations, they put together a really good agenda of exciting and educational talks. Very proud to be uh, one of those, those speakers. Um, but most of all, I'd like to go ahead and thank you all for going ahead and taking the time and, and coming this afternoon. There are other talks, there are competing talks. I'd like to be at some of those other talks too, but I'm glad that you went ahead and came to my talk instead. So, um, formularity. You may not be familiar with us. We're a small company. We're a startup. We do sensitive information enrollment forms. So if you want to go ahead and enroll for health care, you want to enroll for financial with a financial institution, a national um, identification card system, something like that, that's what we were go ahead and that's what we're designed to do. Uh, we take protecting your information very, very seriously. We encrypt everything. Um, for the most part, we would like our clients to go ahead and run our back end on their hardware. They take responsibility for the protection of your data. But some of our clients are looking for a hosted solution. So we've applied the same security to the back end that we did to the front end, but we need to have a back end that can go ahead and scale to a national level since, in fact, some of our clients are doing national enrollments. So what I'm here today, why I'm here today is to share with you the lessons that I learned prior to founding Formularity and then at Formularity as we build out an infinitely scalable back end. Okay, so at this point, nobody's heard of me. Everybody's saying, so what does Brad know about infinitely scalable systems? What does Brad even know about large systems? Prior to founding Formularity, I was a partner in chief, or, uh, and master technology architect with Accenture. Uh, my specialty is national level biometric border control systems and identification systems. So um, anybody here uh, TSA PreCheck? Okay, that's one of my systems. Um, anybody come into the United States for this conference and have to give their fingerprints to CBP? Okay, we went ahead and checked to make sure that you were who you said you were, that you were not on the terrorist watch list, nor did the FBI have a reason to detain you. And we did that in less than 10 seconds. Basically, we just go ahead and turn the dial how many servers we need in order to meet our service level agreement. Um, we probably don't have any dock workers or uh, uh, gas truck drivers here, but if you did, you'd have one of the Transportation Security Administration's Transportation Worker Identification Card, which is a biometric card that allows you to get into our ports or to go ahead and drive hazardous materials. Again, that's a system that I went ahead and developed. Um, and each one of those systems has several million enrollees or, in some cases, tens of millions that we're searching against on the list. But of all those systems, the one that I'm most proud of and the one that I want to go ahead and talk to you to about today, to use sort of as an example of infinite scalability, is the Indian Adhar system. Now, is there anybody here that's familiar with Adhar? Okay. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up. Okay. Um, for you all that are not familiar with it, this is a system that establishes a biometric identity for everybody in the country of India. A large portion of India is what we would consider to be indigent or below the level of poverty. And the Indian government is very good about going ahead and subsidizing food, heat, uh, shelter for these people. But unfortunately, in the past, there's been rampant fraud. Somebody comes in to buy their subsidized grain. The merchant says, oh, I've sold all the, mer all the uh, subsidized grain. He then goes ahead and submits an invoice to the government for all the subsidized grain that he actually went ahead and gave to his friend, who's now selling it on the black market. With Adhar, with us going ahead and giving biometric identification to everybody in India, that means that that merchant now has to go ahead and turn in the biometric receipts 
for the people that he distributed grain to. Even more importantly, most of the people of India can't even open up a bank account. So it's a cash society. And we know how corrupt cash societies can be. With that HAR now, we allow people to go ahead and open up banks. People that don't even have a fixed address can now go ahead and open up a bank account and they can get what we would consider to be their unemployment benefits direct, de uh, deposited directly to their, to their bank accounts. Okay, um, ADHAR affects 1.1 billion people. That's 15% of the current population. So my work is currently helping out 15% of the world population, making their lives better every day. Tremendous sense of accomplishment. But you're not here to hear how good I feel you're here to, how, to, to, to understand how well my system works or the architecture that we went ahead and used for that system. Okay, at the time that I came on board to the Adhar project, Accenture was one of the three biometric solution providers. And we had run into scaling problems. My predecessor did a very good job. He played it very safe. He took the leading biometric middleware and went ahead and used that. Unfortunately, the leading biometric middleware uses a database for tracking matching. And it just wouldn't scale. When we hit 500,000 transactions, we were just basically at a dead standstill. And we needed to be in a position to go ahead and process over a million transactions per day. So when I say enroll, or when I, when I talk about a transaction, what that means is that a million people a day were going ahead and giving the Indian government all 10 of their fingerprints, both of their iris prints and their face. We then went ahead and checked that against all the other fingerprints, all the other faces and all the other irises that were in the database to verify this person was unique, that there was no fraud going on. Okay, so this is one of those type games that as we put more and more things into the database that the problem gets larger and larger. So if we take the Adhar program on quote, its last day, you know, as we were getting up to, to getting everybody enrolled, or really what's now steady state because you've got people moving into the country and you've got births and whatnot. Um, we compare about, we enroll about a million people per day. So, and we're going against a database of about a billion existing enrollees. So, you know, you do the math real quickly, one times 10 to the sixth times, one times 10 to the ninth, one times 10 to the 15th, that's a quadrillion comparisons that we do per day. Um, if you were doing that with a database, that would be 11 billion transactions per second. Um, Oracle's good, but it's not that good. <laughs> well, but now, now Larry, if Larry were here, he might go ahead and, and dispute me on this, because after all, they have real application clusters. Real application clusters goes ahead and runs multiple copies of the Oracle database on different servers, and they all go ahead and cooperate. And if we were to go ahead and believe the, uh, the, the, the laboratory benchmarking, they can scale that infinitely. Now, it's difficult to get real world results on Oracle because Oracle's licensing specifically prohibits their clients from publishing any type of benchmarking information. But one of their partners did go ahead and publish some information. They basically said, if in fact you had an ideal workload, you could go ahead and scale infinitely. But in real world workloads, chances are you can't go ahead and scale an, an Oracle real application cluster above five nodes. And that was certainly my experience in India. Um, I couldn't get above four nodes. And when I say I, that was Accenture and Oracle. Oracle had skin in the game. Oracle had Redwood Shore developers as well as Bangalore developers helping us tune the system and we just could not get above 500,000 transactions per second. So at that point my predecessor exited and uh, I stepped into the landmine. So the first action was to go ahead and, and hold off at 500,000 transactions per day while we put in place the system that I'm going to talk to you about today which involves the actor model, cues, and being polite. Okay, let's stop for a moment and talk about concurrency. Concurrency is simply a computer doing multiple things at once. Early on, it was simple. One processor, one core, one thread of execution. 
any illusion of concurrency was just that, an illusion. You really didn't have to worry about shared resources because there was only one thread of execution that was actually going ahead and trying to share that resource. Nowadays, multiple processors, multiple cores, multiple threads of execution. So we have concurrency problems, and the primary concurrency problem is shared resources. Everybody's trying to share, or more often than not, actually compete for the same resources. And if we don't put the proper protections in place, we get things like corruption, race conditions, deadly embrace, blocked processes, and threads. Some will go ahead and destroy your program, some will just go ahead and drop your program to its knees. The solutions that we come up with, they're bitter pills, locks, mutexes, simplex, uh, semaphores, latches, and monitors. So we've gone ahead and taken something that should be very simple of two processes communicating with each other, and we've gone to a, a synchronization process like this. That synchronization process is not only complex and therefore goes ahead and introduces its own opportunities for errors, but also it slows our system down. <coughs> okay, when you reach the limits of a single computer, how do you scale? You scale horizontally, you put multiple <coughs> computers together. Now we're on the right track. With multiple computers, we can go ahead and scale infinitely as well as we have more resiliency and more availability. However, so long as our applications continue to be interlocked, interdependent, we still have resource sharing problems even in a multi-computer multi situation, uh, in the cloud, if you will. So concurrency didn't go away with the cloud. Um, in fact, it's just as ugly and just as hard to manage as it used to be. <clears throat> now, 1973, uh, almost 50 years ago, Dr. Carl Hewitt at MIT came up with the actor model. So the actor model goes back to sort of like the Turing machine, only it's a model of concurrency. It's how you go ahead and do processing and how you can go ahead and share resources. Actors are very simple. Actors are like objects that only have four methods. An actor can read a message, it can create another actor, it can send out a message or messages, and then it's got an internal finite state machine and it adjusts its internal finite state machine in response to the messages that it's processed. And that's going to affect how it might process the next message. So again, you've got the elements of a Turing machine but you can go ahead and put multiple actors together where, in fact, the Turing machine was just basically a, um, a, 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 um, a single-threaded process. Okay, so why are we interested in the actor model? What does it go ahead and do for us? <clears throat> actors can't go ahead and compete for resources. Actors only use, mo only use messages. The only way an actor can affect another actor is through a message, and we've got visibility of those messages. So it's extremely easy to go ahead and debug. It's extremely easy to go ahead and identify concurrency problems before they would even go ahead and exist. <coughs> Actors encapsulate common resources and serve as resource providers. So instead of having several actors try to update the same index, one actor is responsible for that index and it goes ahead and increments it based on messages that it receives from other actors. So you're beginning to see how the concurrency problems of resource contention begin to go away with the actor model. Okay, each actor, it's small, it does one function. It has a finite state machine or some equivalent inside of it. That is very easy to mathematically prove. So if we can go ahead and prove that each one of our individual functions is correct, then we can go ahead and build less error-prone, more easily proofed systems by combining those parts together. Um, it's very easy to go ahead and test an actor because it's messages. You send messages to it, you get messages back from it. Um, let's see, actors can be, oh, okay. So if you need to go ahead and upgrade your system or you make some design changes and whatnot, again, this is where the object, um, aspect of, of actors come into play. 
Um, so everything's isolated in that actor. You can go ahead and refactor, rewrite that, that actor. And since the message interface hasn't changed, the rest of the system continues to work. But you may have just gone ahead and improved the overall performance of the system by refactoring that particular actor. OK. So bad things happen. Processes die. Actors can create other actors. So when a uh, process dies, when an actor dies, it can be created, it can be restarted, if you will. A new actor can take its place based on another actor. OK, so we can go ahead and combine actors together. If one actor does x, 10 actors can go ahead and do 10x when we go ahead and, and create them that way. That's nothing new. In fact, Brandon did a tremendous presentation just before this on containers. And we've already got derived that essentially from containers. Um, with multiple actors, we've got concurrent, I'm sorry, we've got uh, uh, enhanced availability and persistence, you know. Uh, some actors can go ahead and die, but other actors remain. They continue to go ahead and do the work. Um, actors are very easily connected together. Remember the, the, the Tinker Toys? Uh, the wooden uh, sticks that connected together, the wooden blocks and whatnot. Think of the actor model like that. Each one of those little those wheels is an actor. And we're going to go ahead and connect them together with the wooden sticks. And we can build anything we want to by connecting those actors together. Um, actors, since it's all message based, don't care whether they're all in the same data center or not. So go ahead and distribute your actors around the world. The same set of actor functions can be in each one of your availability zones, each one of your geographical data centers. You lose an availability zone, you lose a geographical data center. The other actors that are responsible for that function are still continuing to work. Um, and then finally, one of the things that, that uh, uh, you notice in, in the real world when you put actors together is actors are relatively small programs, they're relatively small processes. Quite often, they fit right inside the cache of the processor that they're running on. So you get a tremendous speed increase because you're running out of an L3 cache as opposed to running off memory. OK. <clears throat> um, if this sounds familiar, factors sound familiar, and the thing, or rather the, the characteristics I just told you about actors, that's because nowadays we call them microservices. So I think everybody generally agrees that microservices are the way to go. They're small, single-purpose systems that go ahead and, and feed your application and you build your application off of them. But I see a lot of confusion as to exactly what's a microservice. And a lot of people say, don't go ahead and build a whole bunch of little macro services. Don't build a whole bunch of monolithic applications. Connect them together with sockets and say that's a microservice. And I agree completely. If you use the guidance of an actor and you use the messaging paradigm of an actor, you can very easily go ahead and create microservices that truly meet the definition of a microservice and give you all the benefits. So um, like I say, it's just it's, it's microservices, but this is the way that you can go ahead and figure out what you want to build into your microservice. So, I've been architecting systems for about 40 years now. And um, you know, I'm, I'm no genius. But the first thing I look at when I have to go ahead and put a system together is I say, how would a human go ahead and do it? After all, we've got thousands and thousands of years of evolution. Um, we've kind of come up with good ways of doing things. Now, there are some things that computers can go ahead and do uniquely and differently than humans can and do them better. But quite often, the best way to automate something is to take a look at how a human does it and go ahead and use that as a model. It's not infallible, but it's a good starting point. So if we think of actors as real humans, how would we go ahead and solve a problem? Now at Formularity, we've come up with three actor classes, patterns, whatever you want to go ahead and call them. OK. Our first actor type is the office worker. So picture a desk, a person sitting at that desk. That person's got an inbox and an outbox. The person takes the first piece of paper out of the inbox, looks at it, maybe performs a calculation, stamps it, 
puts it in the outbox. Or maybe that person has to make a decision. So there are two outboxes, approved, disapproved. Person just takes a piece of paper, looks at it, puts it in the right bucket. Takes a piece of paper, looks at it, puts it in the right bucket. That's an office worker actor. How many different functions in your application are just doing that? They're doing a calculation, or they're doing a one-step process, or they're making a decision. So that's where you want to go ahead and create an office worker actor to replace that particular function in your application. Supply clerks. OK, this is very rapidly aging out as an example. But does anybody here remember the old TV program or the movie MASH? Oh, good, good. <clears throat> Some people told me that this crowd wouldn't know, wouldn't remember MASH. OK, there was Radar O'Reilly. Radar O'Reilly was the perfect supply clerk. He handled everything administrative. Nobody else could find anything or do anything, but Radar had it covered. And he, for the most part, usually got everything right. OK, so our resources we put behind supply clerks. Do you have a database? Put it behind the supply clerk. The supply clerk actor becomes responsible for your database. That way you can go ahead and do updates and it all goes through the one actor. Now, what happens if there's too much going on for one actor to go ahead and handle it? Well, even Radar O'Reilly some of the times needed help from other supply clerks. So you go ahead and you create a hierarchy of supply clerks. Um, you might, let's still use the database example, um, you might in fact have um, transactions coming in too fast to handle it with just one uh, supply clerk. So the supply clerk may in fact, the, 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 the higher supply clerk may in fact go ahead and talk to sub-supply clerks that are responsible for different parts of your database. Inventory uh, uh, for like A through G. Where do I have? Can't even see that small. OK, but basically we're sharding the database. So you're sharding your actors in order to go ahead and handle the volume. Or you may have replication needs. You may have to have multiple copies, in which case then that one supply clerk sends every update to two other supply clerks. Okay, third actor type that we have at Formularity is called the supervisor. We all know the supervisor. Supervisor doesn't do any useful work, but it manages the labor of everybody else. We've all got supervisors. Doesn't change in the actor model. The supervisor is basically responsible for going ahead and maintaining all of the other workers, the office workers and the supply clerks. Now, it can monitor them through any number of means. The actor model doesn't tell you finitely how you have to go ahead and do things. It gives you the general pattern for which you want to go ahead and use. So for monitoring workers and, and supply clerks, it could do it through specifically monitoring them. It could go ahead and take a look at their output. Um, it could have a heartbeat, it could receive heartbeat messages from the, the, uh, the workers. Uh, that's up to you to go ahead and architect. But basically, that supervisor is responsible for the, uh, the, the work that's being done under it. It's responsible for, the, in, in particular, it's responsible for the time, I'm sorry here, it's responsible for the time that the process is going on. So if the system is not running fast enough, the supervisor is responsible for going ahead and creating more actors in order to go ahead and handle the, the workload. The supervisor is also responsible for going ahead and, and eliminating actors that are no longer necessary because the workload is no longer there. OK. Um, supervisors are definitely hierarchical. Um, in this particular example I've got right here, um, we have a supervisor for office workers, and we have a master supervisor for servers. So all of our server instances are being managed by a supervisor, as well as all of our, our actors running on those servers. So if I've got an actor that's no longer functioning, it's, uh, it's stopped producing, or it's crashed, and we don't get heartbeat messages from it anymore, then the office worker supervisor 
goes ahead and says to the, to the supervisor that's running on that server, please go ahead and kill that office worker. Now, potentially that's not going to happen because that server supervisor may already be dead. The server may be dead. The server may be disconnected from the network, either logically or physically. In which case, then, the master server supervisor is responsible for getting rid of that instance. If it's a virtual machine, killing the virtual machine. If it's a physical machine, locking that machine out and then going ahead and raising the flag that maintenance is necessary on that machine. Uh, and again, if it's a virtual machine, then it fires up another instance and the office worker supervisor can start another actor running on that newly created instance. Okay. <clears throat> Juvenile said, who watches the watchers? Um, we're talking about a large enough system that one supervisor can't keep track of all the actors. Uh, so we have layers of supervisors. Supervisors report up to supervisors, report up to supervisors. And then finally, we have a nice dashboard that allows the human operator to go ahead and assess the, the, the health of the system. And if we've designed it properly, the operator now can go ahead and dive down into any one of the supervisors and find out the state of the servers or the actors or the connecting queues that are running for that particular supervisor. OK, so I said queues. Um, and I talked about actors being the, the round wheels in Tinker Toys. And in Tinker Toys, you have to go ahead and connect them together with those wooden rods. Okay, traditionally, we go ahead and message directly from one part of our application to another part of our application. We use sockets, or we use twisted, or you know, any number of communications means. What we really need to do for infinite scalability, and I don't think this is any surprise to people, is we need to start using queues. Queues have a lot of advantages. <clears throat> a queue is basically an infinitely long mailbox. So instead of an actor having a finite sized mailbox, now we've got a queue that will go ahead and hold any number of messages. <clears throat> um, if for any reason our actor slows down, maybe it's in garbage collection right now, uh, maybe we're waiting for a virtual machine to start up, the messages for that actor can go ahead and accumulate in the queue, and when the actor becomes available, it'll start taking those messages off the queue and processing them. So we've got a built-in buffer. We've got elasticity built into our system. With that elasticity, we can ride through a number of aberrations in the processing of our messages. <coughs> okay, so I talked about sending messages to actors. What you really want to go ahead and do is send messages to the queues and then have the actors pull the messages off the queues. That way, you can go ahead and determine the, 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 the processing state by just looking at the queue. If the queue is getting bigger, you don't have enough actors pulling work out of that queue. If the queue is empty, you've probably got too many actors trying to process messages out of that queue. You've got actors that are sitting idle. So you can release those resources by basically killing those actors. Now, if you're using something like AWS Elastic Beanstalk, you're using something like the CPU utilization or the memory utilization to let you know when you're reaching the limits of a server and when you need to fire up more servers. Okay, as uh, Baron Schwartz showed us yesterday, the time lag between when you see CPU utilization increasing, and when that CPU or when that server becomes unreliable or crashes is very short. So the question is, can you spin up new instances, new containers to go ahead and take over the work before the server gets to, before the server is overloaded and it crashes? And what happens when the server does go ahead and crash? Have you lost information? With queues, you don't have that problem. If all of the actors are dead, the queue keeps getting longer and longer. And you've got plenty of time to go ahead and start up new actors to start pulling messages out of that queue. So you definitely don't have the, the sensitivity to load that you might have even using a, uh, um, something like Elastic Beanstalk and automatically starting new containers. 
Okay. <clears throat> so I think I've kind of explained it in that, you know, this is like, uh, the human analogy might be in a warehouse. You got a pick list, you got pickers, and you got the warehouse. Picker picks the first item off the pick list and says, ooh, I gotta go into the warehouse and I gotta buy an Amazon, or I've gotta get an Amazon uh, Echo. And the next picker picks the list and says, oh, I've gotta go into the warehouse and I've gotta go ahead and get a Schwinn bicycle and whatnot. And it's very easy to go ahead and determine whether you've staffed your warehouse correctly or not. If the pick list is getting longer, you don't have enough staff. If the pick list is empty and people are sitting around drinking coffee, you need to redeploy them, you've got too much staff. The actor model works the very same way. Okay, now the question becomes, what happens if an actor dies while it's doing processing? Like I said, bad things happen. So what we do, well, one of the things we could go ahead and do is we could go ahead and say, every actor has to maintain a copy of its message until it receives acknowledgement that that action has been completed by the next actor down the road. That's essentially TCP. We wait till we get an acknowledgement that the packet was received at the other end and we don't discard until we get that. Okay, TCP is complex, TCP is subject to problems. We don't need to use that type of a uh, method here. What we go ahead and do basically is when I give an actor a message, as a, as a cue, when I give an actor a message, I just go ahead and put that message aside and say, this is being worked on. And that message might have a two second lifetime on it. If I haven't gotten acknowledgement back from the actor that it did the work after two seconds, I'm gonna take that message, I'm gonna put it right back on top of the queue to be processed by the next actor that comes to me and says, I'm looking for some work to do. So we can go ahead and be sure that we don't lose any work until that work has actually been accomplished and been acknowledged. Now, what that means is that you will always process every message. Unfortunately, what it does mean too is that some of the times you may process the same message several times. So what you wanna do is if you're item potent, you don't care. You know, if it says set the value to 10, you don't care how many times you execute it because the value is 10. But if it says add one to the value, that's non-item potent. So you have to go ahead and in that case, put in some sort of a transaction number or some way of going ahead and keeping track of messages so that you don't go ahead and, and process them twice. So again, the queue is not a universal queue. The queue needs to be designed whether it's item potent or non-item potent. Oh yeah, and by the way, if you need the diversity, create two queues send the messages to two queues. Tell the actor, pull your messages from this queue. If you can't get in touch with that queue anymore, then here's your redundant, your secondary queue. Uh, and that's part of the credentials that we pass to an actor when we go ahead and bring up the actor. So the actor's pulling messages and it's doing work and whatnot, and suddenly it's queue's not available. And says, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna go to the secondary queue, goes to the secondary queue and starts pulling those messages. So it never even goes ahead and slows down. You've got the redundancy you need. Maybe you need three cues, four cues. Maybe you need an actor in front that goes ahead and does consensus. Okay, so as I said, I didn't talk anything about registration. You don't register with a queue. An actor knows what its queue is. It just basically goes to that queue and says, give me messages. Which sounds like a recipe for a security disaster. You get a rogue process in there saying, uh, give me all the work in the queue, give me all the work in the queue type of a thing. So you need to be concerned about that, but cryptography is cheap these days. AES uh, NI instructions are in the Intel microprocessor at this point. Um, use the encryption. It's no longer as expensive as it used to be. So a actor can't read a message out of a queue. It can't even authenticate with the queue unless it's got the right public key. Um, you use cryptographic caches to be sure that none of those messages have been altered, either maliciously or some of the times networking accident, accidents happen and messages get distorted. Cryptographic caches, go ahead and identify those. And then go ahead and use encryption to protect your information. I talked to you about formularity and our, our desire to go ahead and protect your information. We don't want your information to be seen in a packet as it's being processed within 
our system or a client system. Okay. <clears throat> this is more than anything the secret to large, infinitely scaling applications. Newton and, and um, philosophy tell us that there are two sides to everything that are in equal balance. Whether you call them yin and yang, accident or action and reaction, you, in data it's push or pull. Okay. Everybody pushes data. FUD's law. If you push something hard enough, it will fall over. I've already talked about the fact with Elastic Beanstalk, if you continue to push messages or you continue to push actions to the server, it will go ahead and crash. So don't push. Be polite. Do what you learned on the playground. Pull, don't push. Actually, you didn't even learn on the playground pull. That's kind of rude, too. But in this particular case, I just want to get across to you, pull, don't push. And if you don't believe me, the esteemed computer scientist Lucille Ball hmm, Okay, I don't know why I don't have sound, but uh, and I'm sure it's, it, it's in my setup. No, don't worry about it, it's in my setup. <laughs> but I think we can all go ahead and see what's happening here. Um, it's being pushed. The work is being pushed. We've only got two actors there. Um, I don't think they're about ready to, to fall over, but they are definitely about ready to get sick. And uh, in a moment, the supervisor, who of course isn't going to do anything other than manage the people, is going to come in, and she's going to say, oh, you're doing a great job. Speed it up, boys. So you don't want to do this to your servers. You don't want to go ahead and push to your servers. Allow them to pull as fast as they can. Now, with humans, eh, maybe you don't pull as fast as you can. You know, you don't break a sweat. Uh, maybe you go over to the water cooler. Computers aren't like that. Computers go ahead and work as fast as their execution environment will allow them to do. So if you allow your actors to go ahead and pull from the queue, you're going to get maximum throughput. And you're going to avoid all of the problems that Baron Schwartz talked about yesterday when trying to go ahead and model queues and the, uh, the essentially scale, or, um, limitations of queues. Okay. Um, and then again, like I said, if you need multiple cues, go ahead and put together multiple cues. Tell your actors, maybe you tell your actors about both the cues and they go ahead and they start round robin pulling against them. This is a tinker toy. Go ahead and construct the tinker toy the way that you need to. Okay. And again, don't use load balancers. Uh, John Looney gave uh, an excellent workshop on building distributed systems on Tuesday. And he spent a lot of time in slides talking about how do you do load balancing? You know, do you do round robin? Well, then you don't know whether the work you're given to the processor, you know, whether the processor is really uh, using, you know, can, is it idle and can accept the work, or is it already busy and it can't accept any more work? Do you try to talk to the actor and say, are you busy or not? Well, if it can answer you, it's not busy, you know, type of a thing. So, any algorithm that we've developed for load balancing will actually go ahead and slow our system down in comparison to allowing our actors to go ahead and pull rather than go ahead and push. So I hope I have belabored this point to death now. Pull, don't push. Okay, two remaining things I want to go ahead and talk about um, that are important in building an infinitely scalable system. That's maintaining state and external inputs. And by the way, uh, these slides are going to be available both on the Formularity website and on the LISA open access website. So everybody's certainly welcome to these slides. 
I see you taking pictures, um, and, and that's perfectly fine, but if you don't want to, to do that. Um, okay. Um, so everything about my talk so far has kind of presupposed that the actor doesn't need input from anything else. The message that it receives is everything that it needs in order to go ahead and do the process. So that's my recommendation. Go ahead and put in the message state. Don't build a system that requires your actor to go out and retrieve state from a database or from shared memory. That's complexity, that's error prone, that's a source of where you're gonna go ahead and slow down. There are some people that go ahead and talk in the actor model about immutable messages. In fact, if you're familiar with the Erlang language, which is one of the prime examples of actor programming, um, they use immutable messages. Okay, that's theoretical or that's, you know, that's the particular approach they go ahead and take. When you wanna go ahead and build a system that'll handle 11 billion transactions per second, put the state in the message, make the state, make the state mutable. Um, when an actor reads a message, it should have everything it needs in order to perform that task, and therefore the messages are not immutable. Okay, <clears throat> just like no man is an island, no application stands onto itself. You've almost always got some sort of input from outside, something that's not under your control. So if we were talking about a federal health insurance system, maybe as part of enrolling, we need to go ahead and check your federal tax return in order to verify how much your income was last year and whether in fact you deducted any health insurance last year. The IRS is great about that. They take all the requests that they get for copies of your federal income tax return, they process them overnight, and they send the results back to you. So what that means is you've got a minimum of 24 hours between you, or I'm sorry, a maximum of 24 hours between you when you make the request and when you get it back. If you're enrolling a million people per day, then that means you've got a million actors that are gonna stall waiting in order to get that message back. Don't do it, that's a, just a, a resource waste. Instead, let's go ahead and use Radar O'Reilly. Let's use our supply clerk. Every time we send a message out to the IRS saying, I would like the tax return of John Doe, let's go ahead and put that, give that message also to the supply clerk. The supply clerk puts it in a data store. And I don't care whether it's SQL, no SQL, key store, it puts it in the store. The IRS sends us the batch load back the next day. We give it to the supply clerk, the supply clerk goes through and matches every one of the replies with every one of the original messages, says, ooh, I got everything that's necessary for the next actor to do its work, and it sends that message off to the next actor. The nice part about that is that we've got a little bit of checks and balance. If a message stays in the data store for more than 24 hours, chances are the IRS lost it, so we resend it. If we got a reply back for a message we didn't send, we've got a problem because we probably lost a message somewhere and so we raise a red flag up through the supervisor to the human to go ahead and do the investigation. Okay, I have about one minute. <laughs> Keep actors small, one defined action. Don't build small programs and call them actors. Encapsulate common resources within actors. This eliminates locks and race conditions. Connect actors together using queues. Don't hardwire them. Monitor workloads by monitoring the queues. Queues only remove a message once it's actually been acknowledged that it's been processed. Otherwise, it goes ahead and times out and gives it to the next actor that needs it. Um, use transaction numbers when you've got truly critical messages that can't be repeated. You can push into a queue, but you must always pull from that queue. Allow actors to transparently connect and disconnect. No registration involved. If they've got the cryptography to go ahead and read the message, they can go ahead and process the message. Keep state in the message between the actors. Each message is self-sufficient. Use crypt cryptographic signatures to validate messages. Use cryptographic encryption to protect the sensitive information. Use redundant actors and queues for persistence and high availability. Map reduce and consensus, whether it's Paxis or Raft, become your friends when you need them. Two other things that actually have nothing to do with the actor model cues or pushing versus pulling, just some uh, experience that we have learned in building large-scale applications is, first of all, 
use the browser, transfer as much of the processing load into the browser. What that means is single page applications. Do all the data collection, do as much data processing as you can in the browser, and just send the results up to your microservice, to your actor. And secondly, use compiled languages. Um, I know everybody likes Python, they like Ruby, but you know, the, the, the faster you can get a process done, the more capacity that you've got in your system. So with that, I want to thank you very much. I have exceeded my time. As I said, copies of the slides are available both through Lisa and through the Formularity website um, after I get back and get a chance, or this evening and get a chance to upload them. So I'm All sorry. Right. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Let's thank our speaker.